Hey everybody, thank you so much for coming out. Um, my name is Max Fields, I'm the communications associate here at the Contemporary Arts Museum and I'm one of the organizers of 20 Hertz, which is the museum's music-based lecture series. Tonight, um, we're really thrilled to welcome uh, a Houston punk band that I'm sure all of you already know, um, but if this is an introduction, you're welcome. Um, and then we're also joined by Dan Workman of Sugar Hill Studios and Nancy Egan from uh, Henry Wild Dog Archives um, for this panel. Um, tonight we're going to do a, a, a live interview um, with the My Dolls, um, and then <laughs> and then and then following that they're going to perform right here in uh, the Brown Foundation Gallery. Um, after the live interview, we're going to have um, you know time for about three or four questions from the audience. Um, so if you think of anything now. Um, you know, hold on to it for the end. Um, and then um, I also want to let everyone know that at the, on Saturday of this week, the museum has a museum experience day. So if you have a little one or you just like to make buttons, you should definitely come out and, um, and, and join us for that from 11 a.m. to uh, 3 p.m. on Saturday. Um, also tonight, um, in conjunction with this program, if you haven't made your way down to the Cullen Education Resource Room downstairs to check out the archive um, provided by the band and put together by Nancy Agin, um, you know, it, with, with, with support from her, and, and um, you should definitely make your way down there and check it out. It's really fantastic. And also, I don't know how many are left, um, but Nancy created a wonderful um, zine for tonight. Um, that you should definitely pick up. It's Rizzo. It's the real deal. Um, but without any um, further, you know, introduction, um, please welcome Dan Workman, Nancy Aiken, and the My Dolls. All right. Let's kick it off with a question to provide some context for those of you who might not have been there for the first wave punk scene. So Houston's first wave punk scene formed around 1978, the same year that My Dolls also formed. And this scene created a new counterculture for Houston at a time when disco and uh, the urban cowboy honky tonks were popular here. So what was the underground music scene like and how did My Dolls discover it and become a part of it? Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna answer it because... I don't remember I'm just going to say thank you everybody for trusting us with your history because not only is this our history, but it's your history. And um, I, w Diane and I were roommates and we used to go to the island every single night and um, probably late 77, we started, seven, early 78 or something, we started going and we saw all these bands and every, all, and, and the bands were, um, uh, plastic Idols and um, Legionnaire's Disease and there were some really really um, great bands and then there were some bands that were well, they weren't that great and so we thought well we could be like that <laughs> we could we could be a band and so the culture I think just stemmed from the fact that it the punk rock was kind of trickling down we were listening mainly to British bands because it was more accessible for some reason than the bands that from from the Midwest and from New York and so the culture was just sort of trickling down and of course Houston in its unique way was just creating it on its own creation so it, it we didn't really have a map we just kind of knew we were pissed off and we we wanted change and we saw fun and we decided go for it so I think I don't know maybe everybody can agree with that or well, Trish, I wanted to ask you and, and Diana, like, why did you decide to form a band instead of just being fans? You know, I mean, like, the, j was, it, was it the barrier of entry was that low, or is it, it you know, what, why, why exactly did you want to do it? I, you know, honestly, that is part of it, is it, we really started from the humble idea that hopefully we wouldn't suck so bad that they would ask us to leave, because I had never played an instrument before, um, so I had no experience and but the thing is when I was in high school I used to play air guitar with a friend of mine in uh. our bedroom because we were gonna be in a the band someday out. that's right 
Um, we were very much listening to the glam rock at the time, to bands like the Sparks, and um, we loved T-Rex, and so we were gonna be in a band someday. So I, I think I always had that as an idea of something that I wanted to do because music was so important to me. Um, I lived in Michigan, which is a very music-oriented state, and it was just a really vital, important thing, and it kind of, um, I don't know about if anybody else can agree with this. I've heard other people say it, but at least twice, maybe three times in my life, music has actually saved my life. I mean, literally saved my life. And so, of course, it was something I wanted to be a part of. Well, how, how, how did the band come apart? I mean, come apart. <laughs> <laughs> well, can we save that well, for that's, later? That's, that's a Freud, Freudian slip on my part. How did the band come about? Like, you know, so you decided to become a band, and how did Linda and George fit into that? I'll talk about how Linda fit in. All right. Uh, I was getting my hair cut at Trish's, and Diana had just had her hair cut, and we, were, a hairdresser. Listening, we were listening to something on the radio, and it sucked. And so we just said, uh, you know, we should just write some stuff. This is really lame. Let's write music. And so Trish said, yeah, let's make a band. Well, and Diane and Trish had already decided they were going to make a band, but I was, like, just coming in to get my hair cut. And so <laughs> I said, okay, well, that'd be great because uh, I think I'd love to do that, but I don't know how to play any – I don't have an instrument, and I don't know how to play it. I don't know how to – you know, I've never taken music lessons or anything. And I said, just get a guitar. So I did, and uh, I still don't know how to read music or anything. It's just – playing by whatever I know the sound sounds like when I put my fingers on certain strings. So I'm, I'm okay with that because that's what I preach at Girls Rock Camp. That shouldn't stop you. Yay, Girls Rock Camp. It shouldn't stop you because you don't know how to play or you've never taken classes. You can still express yourself and write and play music that you like. So, um, yeah, then we just, and then George can talk about how he got involved. Yeah, in, a, in a girl band. Right. In a girl band. Yeah, yeah. in our all-girl band. Right, right. In the all-girl band. So, uh, y'all already, already had the name, right? My Dolls was already... I don't remember exactly. I don't, the I name think of we all went... Actually, Kelly thought of the name. Kelly Younger, Linda's husband. Right. We were at the Taj Mahal restaurant in... So, yeah, the, so the concept was that they were going to form an all-girl band because they could do it just like the guys. Uh, and hey, hey, George, you're uh -huh. a drummer, so we understand, but you like really close to your oh, mouth. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So, Trisha and I uh, are cousins, and, and she's always been a touchstone to me. I hope that she's I'm a touchstone to her, especially when it comes to music. Music was something that we grew up with uh, all the time. So, you know, it was really natural when she invited me to, to play, with the, play with the band. They had, they had tried some girl drummers but they weren't really happy with them. Uh, I'm likewise not a trained drummer. I didn't have a band in high school. I was a garage band player and uh, was playing R&B at the time. Uh, so they invited me to come and, and play with them. But it was, uh, it was a really different experience. Uh, the first thing that they told me was I couldn't play a ride cymbal. I had to play a drum, <laughs> so I had to pick out a drum and play the drum, and that opened up a whole, as you can see with my kit, a whole, a lot of uh, expression and creativity with the drums, so it was really, it was really an interesting experience. I always had uh, in the back of my mind, though, I was going to be the Pete Best, uh, that they would find a woman that was really a good drummer, <laughs> and then they would say, oh, okay, well, we don't need you anymore, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, but one of the things uh, that where, where it really was we were on the road and we got this little fanzine uh, from somewhere in Michigan and uh, when, when this guy coined us three dykes and their father I knew I was in the band <laughs> yeah we tried a lot of different um, drummers, uh, female drummers and um, we needed somebody that could hit really hard and we had like a tabla player that tried to play punk rock, and um, then a girl that. that was playing country western. And it just, we just, and I knew George had the energy. I mean, we grew up pretending we were Sonny and Cher, and and we, we would, we yeah, we were really. It was so I knew he had the energy. So 
it's just a perfect fit. And he's such a feminist, too. He's such a supporter of women. And it just, it's a perfect fit. We're family. So in Houston, uh, the island, the island was Houston's first punk rock club. And so can you talk about some of the bands, touring bands that played with you at the island, as well as some of the local bands? Yeah, Linda and I, uh, as Linda stated earlier, we don't remember much. So we're going to throw this one off to the two in the band that I'm actually remember. I'm going to talk about that. One thing, let me tell you this. I remember playing with the Cramps, and that was the most incredible double was the first show I, mean, I saw you guys. What's better yeah. than the Cramps and My Dolls? I mean, perfect. <laughs> and the poster's downstairs. If you want to see the original poster's down there. It's, my, it's just a match made in heaven, and I remember that one. I thought we I played. actually thought that you guys named yourself My Dolls so you could get a gig get with the with Cramps. The cr- <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, that's hilarious. If, it, if, it, if that's what it took, I was so happy to play with that with that band. Too. Well, you know, the scene was really different. Like, for instance, we played in San Antonio and we uh, we played at a club and the Butthole Surfers opened for us. And then we came back to Houston and we and Rally Rad opened for them at the island. So. So bands like that, we, were, we weren't famous yet, but were just really awesome and just blowing us away. So we, we also get to play with a lot of cool touring bands like Minor Threat. And then we played in Austin a lot. So we, the big boys, and we would, we would switch off with the big boys and the dicks. And, um, you opened for Susie and the Banshees as well? That wasn't at the island, though. That was no. at, Babylon? I think it was called Babylon then, yeah. yeah. So... That was amazing. That was one of my favorite shows. And Ralph, who's going to play with us tonight, played sax with us at that show, and it was it was epic. It was really fun. Yeah. So we played with a lot of cool bands. Like any standout, like besides Susie, things yeah. that you'd, people you played with that, that really sort of shaped who you wanted to be or who you were at the time. Um, well, I play guitar, so she didn't quite shape me. Because she doesn't play guitar, so I, you know, ba- women that play guitar uh, in bands, uh, and I was looking for more of that too, because mainly women were being pushed out in front as just a singer, and there weren't that many women playing drums or playing bass and playing guitar. So I was shaped more by women that were playing guitar, because I needed to learn stuff. I also learned a lot from men, because there were some really great guitar players that that taught me a lot so yeah but I love Susie I mean she was she was really in, fabulous let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure of like the Houston local punk rock scene at the time um, my dolls was instrumental in forming the local punk label CIA records with really red um, three-day stubble um, my band culture side was on that label uh, and, and talk a little bit about why it was important to have a label and wh- what that actually meant in order for us to like get out and, and do what we did at the time. Well, I think it was a collaborative effort, and I mean, what what we ended up doing was, I mean, we we fed on each other's connections. Uh, you know, there was this discography of punk rock. And uh, we would um, find places when we're going on tour that were kind of out of the way and and we probably wouldn't have ever been able to to make those connections, you know. And so we were, you know, doing it the the old-fashioned way, mailing out stuff and uh, press packets and things like that. But a lot of that was because the other bands were doing the same thing. They were doing that. And so they would take a lead. They would go out to California and, and, and... tell us about, you know, where to play and, and the experiences that they had. We, on, in turn, we'd go Midwest, and then we'd tell them about our experiences and, and the, the clubs that, you know, were the cool places to play in uh, Oklahoma City, you know, in uh, uh, Tulsa. So things like that, you know. So it was, it was a, uh, a sharing. It was a really collaborative uh, type of a CIA. Well, it was probably important because there was, you know, no cell phones, no internet. Right. It was Xerox fanzines, and like Nancy's zine um, sort of like exemplifies now. And the ways that we communicated with one another were so different. Right. Um, I mean, you had to have personal relationships sort of one-on-one, press in the flesh, and then you would invite those bands to come back here, or somebody would allow you to sleep there. 
like, were there any sort of interesting relationships or alliances that you guys formed with bands oh, while you were out of town? <laughs> okay, so we played in Cincinnati, and we were on tour, and we were um, driving for hours and hours and hours, and we were so dirty, and we were so, it was one of those times where, and we drive, we were standing at this guy, we'd been riding back and forth, he had a fan scene in Cincinnati, and he was like, okay, you can stay at my house when you come, we're like, cool, because that's way a lot, we all did that, we would just stay in people's houses and in our van, and, you know, just to try to do our best to get to get on the road, and so we were, we drive into this affluent neighborhood where mansions like River Oaks, and we're like, jackpot, dude, we're looking, we're going to stay tonight, and we like pull up, and we get out, and we go up to the front door, and the front door creaks up, and like, and this like guy comes out, and he's like, oh, hello, and the cat poop smell just immediately hits you, and like, you walk in this beautiful entryway, and there's like, magazines and newspapers like lining a pathway to what was sort of a living room and then everywhere you went there was a, a bibliography I mean it was like paper and magazines and newspapers everywhere and that was a creepy creepy place to stay and we but we stayed there and then the next day we played one of the best shows that we ever did in Newport Kentucky but <clears throat> I talked to other bands after about that place because we had Everybody's like, oh, yeah, we stay there. It's, we call it the new Spartan house because it was like ripped up pieces of newspaper that you were sleeping on. It was crazy. Yeah, like a rat. But th that same uh, Newport uh, gig, I mean, they loved us. I mean, they were, again, it was like creative people and uh, creative bands, and then My Dolls came on, and it was like, oh, wow, this is the most creative band that we've ever seen and uh <laughs> and and they would they we came back the following year and, and played the same place and they were like the 12 or 14 people that had seen us were like a hundred people oh yeah i was at that might all show i was yeah i was there you know so we became this legend you know that was like oh yeah that, that band from houston is so anyway but they really enjoyed us and we really felt really welcome there in cincinnati So My Dolls is described as a punk band, and so I wanted to talk about punk, um, not so much as a genre form of music, but punk spirit really being about who you are, expressing who you are, even if it means being different. And Breaking Rules was part of this experimental music scene. And first wave punk spaces were really places where genres blurred, um, diversity thrived. There weren't any labels. So do you still identify with this classic punk ethos or identify as punks? Yeah, that, that's an, um, a question we've got asked a lot over the years because at the same time there was New Wave was around. And um, so punk, when it first started the first wave here, or, which really the first wave here was sort of second wave punk everywhere else because it, it just took a while for everything to get here. And um, so the first wave, I felt like there really weren't a lot of labels and people had a great deal of freedom to be whatever kind of band. Um, so we would have shows with, you know, you'd have bands like Really Red that were pretty hardcore uh, and bands like the Judys, who to me are totally punk rock, uh, even though they're really sort of poppy. But when you listen to the lyrics, they're all about talking about what's happening in culture, sitting in front of your TV too much, watching somebody jump off of a building and commit suicide, do nothing about it, uh, Jim Jones and Guiana Punch. Um, so, and, and we didn't, I don't feel like we felt that there was a lot of separation. We just had kind of, we were all part of the same scene. And yeah, sometimes we'd have petty stuff back and forth that people have just because your personalities. Um, but then I, I did sort of feel like there was a second wave that came through closer to 84, 85 maybe where punk became more aligned and identified as being basically hardcore and thrash and uh, had kind of a more, sp more specific boundaries than it was when we started out. And as far as breaking the rules, like Linda was saying, the truth is since we didn't know what we were doing, we didn't know what the rules were. So we were totally free to break the rules, and we didn't even know we were doing it. The naivete 
kind of plays in and, and you'll hear it in our music. Um, I'm sure we do all kinds of things that we're not supposed to, but it, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, it, it was fun, you know, it was fun just to um, allow the music to come out the way it did and to have the support of, of bands like yours that were such great musicians and also doing such interesting things. Yeah. And, and you played with us, and we loved that, too. Oh, it's on the new record. Yeah. Well, I, I have a, just a, another quick question. Since it was a merging of different genres and stuff, it, it, to me, it seemed like you guys were a big part of the art scene. I mean, here we are in a museum, so I think it's a good question. Did you feel like you were part of the art scene? Did you feel like that you were a larger part of sort of performance art? And, and was that a part of what My Dolls was all about? I think so because we, we a lot of the people we hung out with were you know the artists and like Bill Steen opened up Studio 21 and uh, Melchin and Bill Steen were there and we played there with them and then you know and they were at our shows and we were at their art exhibits and Lawndale Annex was really involved so um, yeah it was kind of a blending of everything and I, I think that that made it different and, um, and, and exciting to me. I, I personally would like to see more blending in Houston like it was in the 80s where it just seemed like with the, with the urban animals and, uh, and the skaters and, the, and also the artists and the performance artists and the musicians and the punk bands, and we would all get together. We were kind of like the, edge, the edgy sort of like outcast sort of people and we would do things together like you would see a poetry reading with an art performance with a punk band. And it was just this weird little, you know, I, and I love that because it's so, it, it just, you can learn so much from each other. And so, I mean, I'd like to see more of that and like film and all kinds of, I don't know, just saying. I, I remember seeing <laughs> Joe Ely come out in like a full cowboy, you know, sparkle suit open for The Clash. Yeah. Exactly. And it's like for the first song, like yeah. the, the audience is just sitting there like. Not quite, you know, nobody wants to break their cool, you know, like Joe Ely, but he won them over. And at the end, you know, people were going nuts for this cowboy, you know, before yeah. the clash came on. And I think that that was very similar to many of the gigs that, that we played together. Yeah. Then we all went to a barbecue together. That was pretty funny. Shh, <laughs> don't, don't talk about the barbecue, you promised me. <laughs> So politics has always shaped the punk ideology and uh, your lyrics as well. Houston's original punks organized with activists um, at Rock Against Racism events, also Rock Against Reagan. Um, My Dolls' lyrics are poetic and esoteric, but also very politically charged. You've written a number of anti-war songs. Can you talk to us about how contemporary politics influences My Dolls' music? It makes us want to sing them louder and faster. <laughs> yeah, um, the thing, is, so this has been, what, almost 40 years, which is sort of crazy, um, since we started this thing, and that's a few generations along, and it's, it's kind of sad to report back that a lot of the lyrics are utterly contemporary. Um, they have to do with the exact same things that we're dealing with now in our culture. Um, a lot of those things, I think, I don't know where you all rest politically, but I really think a lot of those things started with Reagan. Um, there became the separation of classes and things just, this division began kind of back then when we started this music. And, uh, and, and if anything, it's, in some ways it's gotten absolutely worse absolutely worse than it was. And um, so it's, it's kind of sad to me that the lyrics are still so contemporary and I wish there was some way to learn moral lessons that somehow they could be genetically encoded, but that just seems to be something that you can't encode and that's, I guess, part of our human condition and part of what we have to learn here. Um, but yeah, sing it and um, protest and do those things to make a difference. Because we were really into that, and I think that um, we may not have 
changed everything, as you can see, but um, we've formed a lot of great bonds and we've helped each other a lot, at least in making our community, this little community of punk rocks, people better. You know, so you may not influence the world, but you can sure influence the people around you. And I know there are people here I see that are doing that actively. Thank you. I think um, if you haven't gone downstairs yet, and I know Max has put stuff on this SoundCloud for, uh, where you can go to the, the Contemporary Arts Museum and listen to some of the digitalized tapes. We had five volumes of cassette tapes of us on the road and us playing live shows like the Jockey Club. And there's several of them where you can hear, uh, we were on, you know, interviewed on the radio or we had just chatter. One of them is called Tennessee Chatter and it's in the van with us totally like just wired about having played this really great show and we're listening to Carleen Carter and Elvis Costello and the Velvet Underground and I had of course some Zydeco stuff going on because I was, I had some, when they were sleeping I listened to Louisiana music but <laughs> we would talk about the, the, you know, it was just, it was just a hilarious conversation and you feel like you're actually in the van riding on the road with us to Knoxville until the last part you hear on the tape is Smoking on the rat, <laughs> and then it gets really quiet. But then it goes on to the live performances. So there's some really classic stuff on there. And one of the earliest songs was called "Germ Warfare." It was when we had keyboard play. We had Carolyn Hall on keyboards, and it's simple lyrics, but it's just so punk. And, and it's it's uh, uh, I hear a baby, and you know that's my little granddaughter, I think. So okay, uh, the lyrics are. I never breathed fresh air. I'm not afraid of your germ warfare. It's, you know, just like in your face kind of stuff. And it's still classic now. So, uh, yeah, take a listen to that if you can. You have to say about politics? About politics. Well, I think, you know, there was so much going on then. And, of course, there's so much going on now that you have to have a voice for it. I mean, you just can't be silent. And that was one of the things that that uh, that came from our music is we just couldn't you know the things happening really red uh, you know and, and the bands on CIA we were expressing the things that were happening not just nationally but here in Houston you know people being thrown in the bayou uh, you know people getting shot in the head for being gay you know those are those are things like I said that you just can't keep your mouth shut and so we spoke up in our music. Yeah, I have a story, too, that I'll tell sometime where I was arrested back then yes. for not putting on my blinkers when I changed lanes, and I was strip-searched. And um, so and they were calling me racist names. I'm, George and I are Hispanic from um, our heritage is Hispanic, and um, uh, I sued them, and I won. Yay. And Yeah. <laughs> so that's one thing. So, yeah, I, I was pretty pissed off. That was in 1976. And um, so when I met Diana in 77, I was, I, was pretty, I was pretty fucking mad. I was ready to, like, do something. And, uh, and I, I needed an outlet. And I'm an artist, too, as well as a hairdresser. And um, so she also is an artist. She doesn't do as much artwork as she used to, but... You'll see the T-shirts down there that we used to do at our all-night T-shirt painting parties. But we just needed an outlet. And I think that, you know, a lot of artists are stimulated by what's going on socially, what's going on politically. And definitely My Dolls was formed by a political atmosphere. Um, I didn't quite understand it. Um, the more I read and the more I learn about politics, I'm able to have discussions about facts rather than my emotional state with, so that we are, there's a more unified um, um, conversation that goes on rather than me just saying, oh, just fuck off, I hate you, you know, you don't think the way I do. And, you know, and I think that there, we all have to learn tolerance like that. So, um, anyway, that's, I don't know. I don't even know if I can cuss in here. So, but I'm from Texas, for God's sake. <laughs> so, we wanted to uh, also mention 
And you mentioned, Linda, the archive downstairs. To quote a sound clip, My Dolls does have staying power. You, as a band, embody love and positivity as well. And you pay it forward. So tell us um, how My Dolls is empowering the, the youngest generation. So, this is Girls the part Rock where, Camp. okay, who's here from Girls Rock Camp? Stand up and shout. All right. There's more of you, right? There's more out that somewhere. Okay, well, um, they're having camp this week, and their showcase is on Sunday at Fitzgerald's at 5 o'clock. The doors open at 4, and the girls are 8 to 18 years old, and they go to the camp. We were, we've been involved in it since it started. I couldn't do much volunteering this week, but I'll be at the showcase, and I'd encourage you guys to come and listen because these young girls who come to camp and have never played an instrument before and who are really scared and introverted and a lot of times bullied because of their tendency to be artistic, they show up and they form a band and they uh, write us an original song and they perform it on stage in five days. I mean, they go for one week and then they get on stage and there you can just see them um, feeling so empowered and so excited about being on stage. So I, we do everything we can to support them and I'd encourage you guys to give them a listen and, and support them. They, you know, they're volunteers. They, they need donations if, you, if you have, you're so inclined. Um, but go to the camp, go to the camp showcase and listen to them. And, and uh, yeah, we do pay. That's how we pay. That's how I, you know, I get involved as much as I can. And so do the rest of the band. I wanted to say that this isn't just the first time or this particular Girls Rock Camp. It's not the first time that My Dolls has become an image for, for young, young girls. Uh, years ago, I worked with uh, Houston Community College and we had a JTPA grant and, and we were trying to, to look at non-traditional careers. And so uh, they said, uh, you're in a band, aren't you? It's like, hey, how would you like the band to play? And, and it was really, I mean, they took their lunch hour and they came down to the Holman campus and, you know, and we set up the gear and everything and we played and uh, the president of Houston Community College was there and he was like, so which one's the counselor? <laughs> so, but yeah, they, they've, been, they've been doing this again, putting themselves up front uh, and showing that women can uh, perform and, and do things that, uh, you know, the, the guys do. <laughs> Okay, we have like one sort of wrap-up question before we take a couple of questions from the audience, but uh, it's, it's one that I'm sure you can relate to, and, and that is, so here we are in, in 2016, you know, um, and, and as you mentioned, Diana, you know, it's almost 40 years. It's, it's been a really long time since you started doing this. You know, has Midol sort of like lived up to the promise of what you thought it would be? From the very beginning, and and and, or maybe is it has it turned into something different? And uh, you know, do you have any advice for your like twenty year old self? You know, now that you're sitting here talking about it and still doing the same thing. Um, yeah, practice more. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, we really started out with such just such. Um, low expectations and I hate to say that but I mean it was really just about having fun you know what I mean and why not be on stage having fun and not in the audience first of all it's free to be on stage well you think that until you start buying instruments and doing all that other stuff but um, you know um, it has it has gone well beyond anything I could imagine I mean this is this is nuts um, when people use terms to describe us as legendary, uh, it, it, I mean, we, it's kind of a joke in our band. And I don't mean, to, I don't mean to diminish, like, anyone, you know, and, and their feelings. But it's just, we just started out with such an humble beginning and just to have fun and to imagine that, that people from all these different countries know us, people still play our music, young people like Max know who we are is amazing to me. It, it's really extraordinary. 
And I know some of that's a result of the fact that we do have social media and it's easy to put music out there and for people to find out about it. Um, but it's, I mean, we're playing at the cam. That's nuts. You know what I mean? That's nuts. Um, so yeah, what, what I would say to people is, even if you don't know how to play or you don't know how to do something that you wanna do, really, just do it. Learn it, you'll figure it out. You'll figure your own way of doing it out. There, especially with things that are artistic, there's not a right way or a wrong way. There's not a way to do it. And if people tell you that, then find new people and hang out with them, you know? So actually, this is the second museum that we played at. We played at the um, Museum of Fine Arts when uh, Vim Vendor's film Paris, Texas came out. There was a premiere the first time it was shown in the United States, and it was at the Museum of Fine Arts. And thanks to Marion Lentz, who's the uh, film creator, and Ralph McKay, who was our road manager at the time, and he was also film creator there, we got to do that because we were in the movie. And so that was a real honor. So it's kind of weird, like, what punk band goes around playing in museums? I mean, that's it's kind of creepy stalker. It's just, we're stalking museums. <laughs> It's part of breaking the rules. Yeah, we're going to play in the Children's Museum next. <laughs> you may have to watch your language there. Maybe.